Well, welcome to the, to the 2012 um, Common Book Lecture. We, we started this Common Book selection about 2006. Um, imagine this idea at a, at a university that we would bring together a collection of, of faculty and staff and at a university this size and this diverse that we would choose one book that, that we would give to all of our, all of our freshmen. <laughs> one, one book, imagine, imagine the complexity of, of, of that. And the idea was to give this book to our, to our students, our freshmen, and to give it to community and begin a conversation um, around a, a common text, to hold that book in our hands and see if we can come together each year and throughout the year and, 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 and begin with, with words, begin with a book. And I want to start by, by thanking the, this year the group that, that got together to select this particular text. And not only did you select a wonderful text, but the work that you did to convene community around this, this book, to create curriculum around this, this book, and to steward this book all along is very much appreciate, appreciated. And to do it in a way that embodied the very kind of respect that we'll be talking about tonight. So I'd like to acknowledge Grant Collett. Grant, do you hear Grant? Could you give a wave? Thank you, Grant. Dr. Christopher Campbell. Christopher, you're here. Thank you for your work on this. There's Christopher. Leanne Wiles. Leanne, thank you. And Michael Ann Jund. Um, this, this would not have happened if it weren't for the long hours that, that this collection of folks put together to, um, to bring us this book today. So as I mentioned, the common book is distributed to, to all freshmen. And we have students here who are part of freshman interest groups who have read this book and, and, and had a chance to lead discussions together, this book. Th this book, Respect and Exploration, has, has six really compelling and interesting chapters in it. Examines different facets of respect through the very ordinary yet extraordinary lives of these people. A doctor, a law professor, an artist, a hospice worker, a midwife, and a teacher. And the book asks us to think deeply and in new ways about something that seems everyday and common. It challenges us to re-envision what respect means in our lives and in our society. Dr. Lightfoot reminds us that, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot reminds us that respect is treated as something owed or received. She puts it in her introduction, a debt due to people because of their attained and inherent position. Respect is not a value to be exchanged or traded, bought, or sold, rather. Respect is a mutually created good. It both produces and is a product of relationships of trust, empathy, and symmetry. We do not give or receive respect. We make it together jointly and in fellowship with one another. When I first read and taught this book, I asked myself, am I living up to the expectations of this book? And, and as I read it and I taught it more, I realized that's not the question. The question is not about me. It's about us. It's about how we, how we are with one another. For it to be true, it must be experienced as a verb, not as a noun. And for it to be of value in our lives, it must uplift and empower, not just one party, but all of us. Regarding Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, she is the Emily Hargroves Fisher Professor of Education in the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. She is the author of 10 books, including her latest exit, The Endings That Set Us Free, and dozens of scholarly articles. She has honorary degrees from 25 institutions of higher education, in addition to her own doctorate from Harvard University. And she, she's received numerous awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship for her writing and contributions to education, social justice, and scientific discovery. She is, and take note of this, the first African-American woman in Harvard's history to have an endowed professorship named in her honor. That alone is deserving of some applause. <laughs> Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot is foundational reading on our own College of Education, and now is foundational reading for the class of 2016, assuming it's 2016 for you. Tonight, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot will speak for about 50 minutes, and then we will take questions. So would you join me in welcoming 
Dr. Professor Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm very, very happy to be with you all this evening. This evening, surrounded by the soaring spirit of Aretha Franklin, I would like to talk to you about respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. Show me just a little respect. I believe that respect is the most powerful ingredient in creating authentic relationships, in nourishing good and productive educational cultures, and in building healthy communities. It is a core American value, embraced by all of us, animating our personal and professional relationships, deserving to be at the center of a rich discourse marking your first year in college, a time of enormous dis transition reflection, and anticipation. For those of us who are teachers and students, respect is a beautiful and crucial concept. We hear it in our rhetoric, we map it into our metaphors, we witness it in our relationships, we embroider it into our pedagogy, we build it into our curricula. We try to be vigilant in practicing it, and we recognize its pragmatic, philosophical, and spiritual values. And respect extends from local neighborhoods to global communities. It is the core of a thriving democracy in a civilized world. Never has a dialogue been more, been about respect been more timely and more provocative than now, demanding our engagement, commitment, and attention. It is, in fact, impossible for us to have any conversation that refers to teaching and learning or that speaks about human rights and social justice, without our minds being flooded by the bloody images of the last decade or so, by the tragic cataclysmic events of September 11, by the murders of innocent mothers and children in Afghanistan, by the brutal bombings and attacks in Israel and Palestine, and the volatile border conflicts between India and Pakistan, by the genocide and raping of women and girls in the Sudan, by the terrifying and protracted war in Iraq and the oppression and massacre of hundreds of thousands of people in Tibet, by the uncovering of rampant pedophilia by priests and bishops of the Catholic Church, by the separations and suspicions of racial, cultural, and religious discrimination, pitting newcomers against old timers, refugees against established and entitled citizens by the Wall Street crash following the unleashed greed, deceit, and corruption by a whole host of corporate giants, underscoring the vast abyss between the privileged few at the top and the marginalized many at the bottom, by the foreclosures of homes formerly inhabited by the hardworking middle class and the rising number of homeless people struggling to survive. And as we reach the crescendo and cacophony of the presidential election, which will be decided tomorrow, we are stung by the discourses of disrespect in all of the contest at the local, state, and federal levels. The harsh rhetoric, the lies and greed that mask as strategy, the trumping of style over substance, the contestants in a duel that often seems remote from the principles of democracy. The symbolism and reality of these assaults taken individually or collectively make us feel helpless and vulnerable. Our tears express our deepest anguish, fears, confusion, and rage. Our democratic values and civil rights seem to be crumbling around us as we work to find our moral and spiritual anchor. In our families, schools, and communities, we struggle with finding the right words to support and guide our young people. During these last several years of acute anxiety about our fragile and troubled world, we educators, our society's public adults, have felt a particular challenge and responsibility to protect the children and young people in our charge to help them come to terms with these awful 
cruel events and their aftermath, to find a precarious balance between mourning and moving on, between revenge and reconciliation, and between grieving and getting busy. The echoes of Aretha's wail have continued to resound across the generations. For many people of your generation, we hear the respect anthem, defiant and powerful, in Lady Gaga's theatrical rendition of Born This Way. But over the years, in popular culture and political discourse, our rhetoric about justice and respect has begun to sound stale and over-rehearsed, much too facile. The shadows of darkness and violence that have preoccupied us recently compel us to recognize how very precious and fragile are our democratic principles, how very hard it is to sustain and nourish respect, and how complex the work of authentic inclu inclusivity turns out to be. These themes of social justice and human dignity have been central preoccupations in my life and in my work. I have also worried a lot about how difficult those goals are to accomplish, both institutionally and interpersonally, about the great distance between our espoused values and our daily habits. And I have worried about finding ways of, of addressing our chronic laments and our tired rhetoric. The opportunities and casualties of our dual quests for excellence and inclusivity then have been resounding notes in my siren song, particularly as I have explored in my research and in my writing the contours and dimensions of respect, as I have tried to shape a reconstructed view of this beautiful term. I remember feeling the power and majesty of respect and the deep connections between respect and justice at an unforgettable moment of grace. It was April of 1986 at the burial and requiem of my father, Charles Radford Lawrence II. My brother Chuck was giving the eulogy, his intimate and loving view of a very public man. Chuck's voice cracked as he recalled one of our father Charles's loveliest qualities. And I'm quoting my brother's eulogy. Our father Charles had a natural air of authority about him. He commanded respect without ever asking for it. In high school, my rowdiest friends, the guys who stole hubcaps and crash parties, were perfect gentlemen in our father's presence. They'd stand and they'd say, yes, sir, Dr. Lawrence and answer his many questions about school and home and where their parents and grandparents were from. It was much later that I realized Dad's secret. He gained respect by giving it. He talked and listened to the fourth grade kid in Spring Valley who shined shoes the same way he talked and listened to a bishop or a college president. He was seriously interested in who you were and what you had to say. And although he had the intellectual and physical tools to outmuscle a smaller person or mind, he never bullied. He gained your allegiance by offering you his strength, not by threatening to overpower you." End quote. In my brother's words that day, I heard the recovery of re rich meanings of respect. Through my tears, I heard the lovely symmetry and reciprocity, not the static hierarchy. I heard the tender transfer of authority, not the power plays. I heard the deep curiosity, the need to know, the urge to understand, not the arrogance of knowing enough or knowing it all. And I heard the beauty in the ordinary daily gestures, not the drama and glory of great public moments. I am sure that my brother's words of gratitude and loving farewell have burned their way into my heart, fueled my interest in respect, and shaped the way I understand and interpret its meanings. As a researcher and educator, I have also seen the power of respect in schools and classrooms, 
seen the ways in which respect is crucial in nourishing and sustaining relationships between teachers and students. In the last 35 years, for example, I have visited literally hundreds of schools across this country, from city schools in poor communities to affluent suburban schools, from remote rural schools to elite preparatory academies. And in all of them, I have asked students to identify their good teachers and to tell me why they think they are good. The students' answers across all of these very diverse settings are always the same. Why do we think Mrs. Browning is a good teacher? They ask me incredulously, as if I should know the answer. Because, they say, she respects us. I push further, trying to discover what they mean by respect. Again, there's no reluctance or ambivalence in their responses. They feel respected by teachers who make them feel visible and worthy, who are demanding, who hold high standards for them, who insist that they learn. And they feel disrespected or dissed by teachers who never bother to get to know them, who let them off easy, who do not take them seriously, or believe that they can be successful. Respect, then, grows in relationships of expectation, challenge, and rigor. It is diminished by inattention, indifference, and empty ritual. In A Gathering of Gifts, a beautiful book by my sister, Paula Lawrence Waymiller. You see, I brought both of my siblings to the stage with me tonight. She's a masterful and compassionate educator. She's an Episcopal priest and a wonderful storyteller. She recalls in this book the weeks of grueling anticipation after her first, before her first day of kindergarten and speaks about the primal fears that we all experience when we enter new communities. Her story rehearses the raw feelings of vulnerability and yearning for visibility and voice, the desire we all have to be known. So I'm quoting from A Gathering of Gifts. It is 1951, and summer has come to a steady, hot, quiet hum in late August. A healthy amount of boredom in the air begins to let the summer end making way for anticipation of my first day of kindergarten, the beginning of school. My brand new first day of school dress hangs on the mirror over my bureau. Red plaid, I think, with a white collar. New cotton undies and slip and soft white ankle socks are folded on the bureau. And in an open shoebox with white tissue paper unfolded enough to see them, are my new red school shoes. My mother had told the salesman something sturdy in a school shoe. I had been picturing bright red patent leather party shoes and was crestfallen when sturdy signaled the salesman to bring out brown with a tie. Mom and I must have persevered, each with our own image of what my first school shoes would be, because I ended up with ox blood, red leather, with a double strap and double buckles. Pretty, but sturdy. Handsome was my father's peacemaking word for the compromised shoes. Every end of August night before going to bed, I would carefully lift the shoes out of the crisp paper, smell the fresh new leather, and put them on the floor next to my feet and think. I am going to school. I'm going to step up the big high steps onto scary Mr. Gerke's scary big school bus, where I've heard that the big kids chant, kindergarten baby, stick your head in gravy, <laughs> when the little kids get on. I'm going to a real school in a strange new place. Will anybody know who I am? The big question. Will anybody know who I am? 
for teachers and for students across the developmental spectrum from kindergarten through graduate training, the question is the same. And respect is a potent, omnipresent concept. It is on our tongues, embedded in our rhetoric. It is central to our value frameworks and institutional missions. And it shapes our daily actions and interactions. It is therefore both practical and prophetic. Since many of you here have read my book, you know that my view of respect challenges traditional conceptions of the term. So let me briefly remind you what I mean by respect, identify what I think are its key dimensions, focus on a quality of respect that I find to be one of the most surprising and one of the most generative, and look at the work and wisdom of one of the practitioners of respect who I think embody this, embodies this quality. I will close this evening with eight challenging lessons because I can't resist being the te teacher for those of us who seek to join the practical and the prophetic in our daily lives. And for those of us who want to build families, communities, and schools animated by respect. So what do I mean by respect? Respect is commonly seen, as Dr. Taylor said earlier, as deference to status and hierarchy. Usually respect is seen as involving some sort of debt due people because of their attained or inherent position, their age, their gender, their class, their race, their professional status, or accomplishments. Whether defined by the rules of law or the habits of culture, Respect often implies required expressions of esteem, approbation, or submission. By contrast, I focus on the ways in which respect creates symmetry, empathy, and connection in all kinds of relationships, even those such as parent and child, teacher and student, doctor and patient, employer and employee, commonly seen as unequal. Rather than looking for respect as a given in certain relationships, I'm interested in watching it develop over time. I believe that respect generates respect. A modest loaf becomes many. With that in mind, I'm interested in how people work to challenge and dismantle hierarchies rather than how they reinforce and reify them, as well as the ways in which the organizational context, the setting, shapes the ways in which people engage in respectful relationships. And since I focus on individuals, it is important as well to consider how family roots, temperament, and life stories shape the ways in which people get to become respectful and respected. Rather than the language of inhibition and constraint typical of a more old-fashioned view of respect, I'm always listening for the vo voices of challenge and exuberance. Rather than the language of dutiful compliance, I hear the words of desire and commitment. Rather than the broad and esoteric abstractions of philosophers and moral developmentalists, so distant from the complexities of people's daily lives, I watch for the details of action and try to decipher the nuances of thought and feeling. In my book that begins with birth and ends with death, I identify six dimensions of respect, not to be heard as discrete ingredients of a prescribed recipe, but rather as a framework for considering the rich and experiential complexity of the term. Each of these dimensions reveals a different angle of vision. So let me say what, very briefly what these six dimensions are before moving on to talk about a major protagonist of respect. The first dimension is empowerment. When we are respectful of others, we want to offer them the knowledge, the skills, and the resources that they need that will allow them to make their own decisions and take control of their lives. The second dimension is healing, healing. In showing respect for another, we hope through our work and through our actions to nourish a feeling of worthiness, wholeness, and well-being in them. 
Healing is a word that we hear too, too rarely, really, in educational circles. The third dimension is dialogue. In showing respect for another, we encourage authentic communication. We listen carefully. We respond supportively. We are willing to move through misunderstandings, distortions, conflict, and anger towards reasoning and reconciliation. The fourth dimension, and the one on which I'll focus my remarks this evening, is curiosity, curiosity. When we are respectful of others, we're genuinely interested in them. We want to know who they are and what they are th thinking, feeling, and fearing. We want to know their stories and their dreams. The fifth dimension of respect is, of course, self-respect. In order to show respect to another, we must feel good about ourselves. Self-respect, however, must not be confused with narcissism or entitlement. It results from a growing self-confidence that does not seek external validation or public affirmation. It is learning to live by our own internal compass, one defined by a daily and a private vigilance. And the final dimension of respect that I explore in this book is attention, attention. When we are respectful of another, we offer our full and undiluted attention. We are fully present. We are completely in the room. We are sometimes engaged in vigorous conversation, but sometimes we are bearing silent witness. So I want to talk to you about curiosity and its messenger, a man named Dayud Bey, because I think it is perhaps the quality of respect that surprises and enhances our view more than any other. Curiosity, it seems so innocent, so ordinary, so doable, and it seems to be the least tainted by political hype or tired rhetoric. It also seems so fundamental to relationships of all kinds. Relationships between lovers, between parents and children, between teachers and students, between mentors and mentees, among peers and colleagues. All kept alive by genuine curiosity, by wanting to know and be known, by the search for knowledge, by discovery, openness and attention to newness and change by making oneself vulnerable to hearing things painful or incoherent. And curiosity is fundamental to our quest for justice and our commitment to inclusivity. Individually and institutionally, we must be genuinely interested in the, in the stranger's voice and in the challenges and opportunities that his or her new perspectives will bring. Let me hydrate myself. As an artist and photographer, Dayud Bey creates larger-than-life-sized color portraits that allow us to see into the psyche of his subjects. His powerful images hang in art museums across the country and across the world. When Dayud talks about his art, he points to the development of relationships with his subjects at the center of his work. He believes that photographers must enter into relationships with their subjects that are mutual and symmetric, where both photographer and subject are unmasked, making way for trust and dialogue. Dayud's photography is more about discovery, more about finding out what is true for each person through listening to his or her stories than it is about presenting a likable portrayal. For him, photography begins always with a deep curiosity. I am endlessly curious, he says about the primary motivation that defines his respectful regard of the people with whom he works. In his early 20s, Dayud began his career hanging out in the streets of central Harlem in New York City, streets that were both exotic and familiar to this middle-class black boy from Queens. For five years, from 1975 to 1980, he worked to develop his unique approach to making pictures about the human experience. 
His hanging out was methodical. He would select a particular area, usually a 10 block square from 125th to 135th Street, moving from east to west. And he would land there each day with his 35 millimeter camera hanging around his neck. For several days, he wouldn't take any pictures, just stand around, approach people, and begin a conversation. Sometimes he'd go to the same bus stop for several days in a row and begin to recognize the people who would arrive at the same time of day. They would also begin to notice him, and eventually they'd strike up a conversation. This was very hard for me, admits Dayud. I was an incredibly shy person by temperament. As a child, I was very reticent. I was a stutterer, fearful of reaching out to people. I think making pictures was the way I began to engage people, the way I began to come out of my shyness. But even as a novice, Dayud knew that photographs grew out of relationships and that the process had to be reciprocal. This reciprocity usually emerged out of sharing of stories. Despite his shyness, Dayud thinks that part of the reason he was able to learn how to reach out to people was because his father was an amazingly friendly and gregarious man who had an, in a, uh, had an ability to engage everyone. He could stand on the street all day and enjoy talking to anybody about anything. Dayud remembers how his father, Ken, would stop and talk to the man selling hot dogs on the street corner. His curiosity was provoked by anybody. He'd ask the guy how long he'd been selling hot dogs, who his supplier was, how much profit he made, and so on, just endlessly curious. But it was not only that Ken was eager to engage in conversation that amazed his son. It was also his ability to connect with all kinds of people, whatever their status, whatever their station. Ken was an electrical engineer by training, and he usually held the position of manager or director in whatever shop he worked. But he never used the power of his position to diminish others or to pull rank. Dayud remembers visiting his dad at work and never having the sense that he was the boss. He had an easy relationship with all the men and women who worked with him. Dayud loved his father's curiosity, his gregariousness, and the even-handed way he dealt with everyone around him. Even though he grew up feeling awkward and shy, so different from his father's ease and cool, he must have absorbed some of his father's social inheritance. In his early days meeting people and taking pictures in Harlem, a part of his father seemed to grow up in him. When Dayud describes the curiosity and commitment that are part of his work and the depth and complexity that he strives for in his portraits, he takes me on a flashback to his second grade teacher at PS, Public School 123, a school filled with African-American teachers and students in Queens in New York. When he photographs his subjects and bathes them in light, he wants them to feel seen in the way he felt seen in Mrs. Jones's classroom. Mrs. Jones, he recalls, was profound and extraordinary and very inspiring. In what way profound? I asked, somewhat surprised at a word that seems to go beyond most people's recall of their experience in second grade. His response is immediate. She established real relationships with every single child in her class. Everything was possible, and everyone could do it. Ever since second grade, all of Dayud's other teachers and all of his other educational experiences have been measured against Mrs. Jones, her amazing skill and compassion, and they have all come up wanting. By the third grade, Dayud's parents had enrolled their son in PS 131, a higher achieving white school where he was the only black child in his class. 
where he remembers feeling an uneasy and unnamed anxiety every time he stepped off the bus and into the school. Dayud recalls an incident in fourth grade when one of the little girls got her lunch stolen and he looked up to find the teacher singling him out. He saw her cold stare, her accusatory finger waving in his face, and he felt baffled and confused. I was innocent. I didn't even get the connection. Me, he stammered. Are you talking about me? Asked Dayud in a sweat. Yes, she meant him, and he was to go down to the guidance office immediately. He was the culprit. She knew. There was no doubt in her mind. Dayud rose up from his seat, walked the long march to the door amid the quiet stares of his classmates, and dutifully took himself to the guidance office, where, as he remembers it, the counselor gave him some weird tests, putting square pegs in round holes. In Dayud's memory, this is one story among many. I'd get singled out, he recalls. Much of the time, I was in a conflicted state. There were strange things going on, but what do you say? I couldn't name what was happening to me, and I couldn't find the words or the courage to ask. The following year, in fifth grade, he remembers that the class was writing a group play about colonial America, and the play was to be written in verse. Dayud loved the assignment, and he leapt right into the middle of the work. The teacher was gratified by the way in which the class pulled off the assignment so quickly and with such apparent ease and mature collaboration. She inquired of everyone how they had been so incredibly productive, and the children all pointed to Dayud, who smiled back shyly. I remember, says Dayud, with hurt in his eyes still, how her expression changed in that moment the raised eyebrow, the amazement, the surprise. The teacher must have applauded his inspired work, and she must have thanked him for his contribution. But the only thing that Dayud can remember is her utter bafflement and his inner confusion. The teacher was unable to reconcile his brightness with her stereotype of him. How could this black boy produce this verse? She seemed tormented by this. Dayud's tales of being painfully misunderstood, the ways in which his fourth and fifth grade teachers were blinded by their prejudice, remind me of the opening passages of Ralph Ellison's classic novel, Invisible Man, a book published just before Dayud was born may be a good common book for this place. Certainly a very old classic. I'm quoting from the opening passages of Ellison's book. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me, like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows. It is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. End quote. The plight of Ellison's Invisible Man echoes through Dayud's later childhood stories. He suffered what Ellison describes as the construction of their inner eyes. And he learned the hard way that to exist, we must be visible. The contrast between the biased oversight of his teachers at PS 131 and the full empathic attention bestowed by Mrs. Jones surely influenced Dayud's approach to his art. His photographs, motivated by curiosity, shaped by a commitment to his subjects, and their consent and participation, allow his subjects to express themselves, 
bathed in respectful attention. Our view of knowing, really seeing, the people in our lives, in our relationships, our schools, our families, our communities, and our world, might be influenced by Dayud Bey's masterful and compassionate lens. Threaded through his story, we see the daily acts of justice, the warm embrace of inclusivity, and the relentless curiosity that says yes to Sister Paula's haunting question. Will anybody know who I am? Times have changed since Ralph Ellison spoke about the anguish and isolation of invisibility. And times have changed since Dayud Bey suffered the assumptive caricatures of his teachers who could not see his beauty or his braininess. And times have changed since my sister Paula climbed onto the school bus hoping to be seen, known, and cherished when she crossed the threshold of her classroom. But I would argue that the lessons drawn from their stories have even greater poignancy now when our schools and communities remain rigidly segregated by race, ethnicity, and class, when our long-standing aspirations for schools as the institutions for individual and group mobility, as the engines of access, opportunity, and justice continue to be unrealized. When Lady Gaga's born this way has become this generation's war cry against the violent bullying of outcasts that has become epidemic in our society. Dayud's story and Paula's haunting plea feel both anachronistic and contemporary, both time limited and timeless. So in closing, I want to offer up eight lessons that I believe are important for those of us who want to honor and enact our dual missions of excellence and equity and welcome the exciting and difficult challenges of transforming and deepening our educational experiences. For those of us committed to embracing diverse voices and inclusive communities, and for those of us who want to, in small and incremental ways, in large and bold ways, through acts of courage, critique, and resistance, help to reshape the uncivil public discourses and harsh injustices that have for too long prevailed. So I'm giving you my best shot. Eight lessons, um, partly from living, partly from research, long-earned wisdom. Here you go. First lesson is on symmetry. We need to reconstruct our images of and metaphors for respect. The old views of respect that emphasize hierarchy, approbation, and obedience based on habit, ritual, or law tend to lead to relationships that are static, unequal, and constraining. People become stuck in their roles of power or impotence, responsibility, or irresponsibility, and are neither challenged nor inspired to try on other personas or develop new ways of being. Respect that is symmetric and dynamic, on the other hand, supports growth and change, encourages communication and authenticity, and allows generosity and empathy to flow in two directions. The image I hope you will have here is one of a circle, not a triangle or a pyramid. From this new perspective, differences in power, strength, expertise may remain, but it is the respect between us and among us that creates a relational and generative equality. My second lesson is on relationship. Respect grows in relationship, and it is shaped by the context or the setting. I cannot possibly envision respect in the abstract. It is grounded in individual reciprocity and engagement. It is defined by the immediacy of the moment and the constraints of the setting. It is visceral, 
palpable, conveyed through gesture, nuance, tone of voice, and figure of speech. One of the reasons that to dis has become a verb spoken by all of us, not just too cool talking adolescents, is because it seems to capture in one sharp syllable the potency of respect not given, the moment when we are suddenly made to feel diminished, demeaned, and dismissed. Those of us seeking to nourish respect then must see its embeddedness in growing relationships and appreciate the immediate and the visceral way that it is transmitted. My third lesson is on civility. It is important that we not confuse respect with civility. Although these notions are related, they are certainly not the same. Civility refers to the rituals, routines, and habits of decorum and that characterize a gracious encounter. We think of the etiquette of politeness and manners, an important but relatively surface engagement. Respect certainly includes attention to the rituals of civility, but it goes much deeper. It penetrates below the polite surface and reflects a growing sense of connection and empathy and trust. It requires seeing the other, the stranger, as genuinely worthy. We're getting there. My fourth lesson is on storytelling. Storytelling is at the center of respectful encounters. Stories lubricated by genuine curiosity, authentic questions, and attentive listening. Stories also allow for rapport and identification across the boundaries of class, race, gender, prejudice, and fear. Through the unique and specific aspects of each other's stories, we discover the universals among us. And remember, stories are not exclusive property. One story invites another story as people's words weave the tapestry of human connection. My fifth lesson is on language. If we are to make progress, towards an authentic pluralism, a real diversity of voices in our schools, in our universities, in our communities. Then I think we have to listen carefully to the language we use and get rid of code labels like inner city, at risk, disadvantaged, even urban, that are masks for words we refuse to say in the politically correct and subtly racist environments we tend to inhabit. And we have to strike or at least revive and reinvest in tired terms like diversity that have, I believe, lost their punch and lost their challenge. One of the reasons that I love the word curiosity is because it is so plain, it is so core, so untarnished. It is curiosity in Dayud Bey's work that resists caricature that resist stereotype. If we really practice curiosity, we will be genuinely interested in understanding the colors and differences in our midst. We will be eager to get to know the stranger. And my sixth lesson is on dissonance. Dissonance. Getting to know the stranger is not only motivated by curiosity, it also requires that we anticipate the inevitable moments of misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and missteps, that we prepare ourselves to navigate the moments of distrust and disappointment, that we choose carefully when to fight and when to engage the conflict that may open up the path towards reasoning and reconciliation. In other words, in building respectful relationships and healthy organizations, we must welcome the dissonance of voices and perspectives. In fact, we need to learn to love the dissonance, the noise, the spark, the discomfort, the challenge that it causes. It cries out for notice. It demands attention. It pushes towards resolution. Whether it is the dissonance in Miles Davis's sketches of Spain 
or the haunting harmonies in Alicia Keys, or the flash of rage or defiance in a dioid bay portrait. It allows us to see the conflict and the resistance and to reflect on it, and if we are courageous enough to take respectful action. And my seventh lesson, next to the last penultimate lesson, is on family origins. The imprint of family is powerful in shaping the ways we each negotiate respectful relationships. As we try to create relationships that are nourishing and challenging, that have respect at their center, we often confront the ghosts of our parents and the haunts of our early experiences as children. These echoes can be inspiring. That is, we can create relationships that have the imprint of our parents' generosity and empathy. This was the good fortune of Dayud Bey, who inherited his father's irrepressible warmth and curiosity. But others of us must work to challenge harsh and troubling generational echoes. We have to try hard not to unleash on others the assaults our parents or caregivers wittingly or unwittingly inflicted upon us. As students and teachers engaged in respectful encounters with one another, we must do the opposite. We must act out of compassion and empathy, restraint and connection, and in so doing, heal ourselves. And my final lesson, my eighth lesson, is on silence. Respect is not just carried through talk. It is also conveyed through silence. I do not mean an empty, distracted silence. I mean a fully engaged silence that permits us to think, feel, breathe, and take notice. A silence that gives the other person permission to let us know what he or she needs. Several months ago, in the midst of all of the cacophony, hurled insults and verbal sparring that we have almost grown inured to as we have endured the long march to the election tomorrow, President Obama sent up a plea for the silence and listening that are at the root of respectful discourse. His words almost sounded like a prayer. It is important, said the president, for us to pause for a moment and make sure that we're talking with each other in a way that heals, not in a way that wounds. So in nourishing respectful relationships, we must develop receptive antenna. We must take on the role of witness. And we must learn to live in the stillness. At the still point, says T.S. Eliot, in his famous poem, Four Quartets. There is the dance. At the still point, there is the dance. Birth and death join at such moments, inviting our deep curiosity and our full attention. For the dying, and I believe for the living, the immediate moment, the immediate moment is the most significant. Now is the time. Now is always. Thank you very much. Thank you.